All right, so let's get into this tonight. Tonight's got, I got to put something on first before we get into it. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Yes, look at that. Authentic and from Jerusalem. Yes. I think some of y'all know where I'm going right here. How cool is that, y'all? Oh, I can feel it now. I can feel the pushback. Well, bless God, I'm not in the Old Testament. I'm in the New Testament. I don't need no prayer shawl. I know that. I don't wear a prayer shawl every day. I, I don't wear a prayer shawl hardly at, ever, uh, at all, and I don't need a prayer shawl to pray. But tonight's subject is the subject of the mantle. The mantle. And, of course, you can probably figure out by the thumbnail that uh, this is the story of Elijah and Elisha. But I want to read a couple of scriptures to you tonight as we get into the Word of God. Uh, here we go. Uh, we're going to actually start uh, in the book of John tonight. Let's, let's go there. In John chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, excuse me, it's not John. It's 1 John. It's 1 John. Let me add that right there. So, yeah, it's 1 John. I knew that wasn't right. It's 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says, Little children, it is the last time. Now, I'm reading from the King James Version. The last time means the last days. It is the last time, and you have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been with us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an unction. Everybody say unction. You have an unction from the Holy One. Now, I, I chose the King James for this. I typically teach from the New King James, but I chose the King James because I love that word unction. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But we have an unction from the Holy One, and you, have, and, and, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you, you know not the truth, but because you know it that no lie is of the truth. There's a reason why. This Alabama boy preached from the New King James Version because it's hard for me to read sometimes in, that, in the Kang's English. But, all right, so let's go back here for a second. And I'm going to show you something very, very powerful. So it says, little children, this is the last time. So we know we're talking about the last days, okay? The last days, he talks about the spirit of the Antichrist that was already in the day of, of John, in the day of Paul. Paul writes about the spirit of Antichrist. John is writing about... Uh, that there are already many antichrists that are already manifesting and showing themselves. Now, the key thing I want you to get in this scripture, and stay with me now, don't forget to smash that like button. Don't forget to smash that like button. Very, very, very important for you to smash that like button. Right down below us on YouTube, you're on Facebook, give us hearts. You're on Rumble, hit that thumbs up. There's a thumbs up right there on Rumble as well. Uh, comment on Rumble, get involved in the live chat, start building that live chat on Rumble. And then, of course, on X, make a comment there on X as well. But it says, it talks about a group of people that left the fellowship, that left the church, if you will. And um, it, says, it says that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. I want you to know that there's a great falling away that the Bible pro prophesies and predicts in the last day. And I'm going to tell you why I'm teaching on the mantle. It is because the mantle is, is a physical thing. Now, spoiler alert, the reason I'm wearing a prayer shawl, the Jewish people call it the tallit, the reason I'm wearing an authentic Jewish prayer shawl is, number one, it's cool. Uh, but uh, And it's very, um, to, to the Jewish people, it's a, it's a very, very special uh, article of their clothing and covering. It's known as a prayer shawl. You know, most people know that, you know, if you see people wearing it, they usually wear it like this as a prayer shawl. And, you know, some interesting things about the prayer shawl is this, is that when Jesus, you know this part where Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet, pray in your prayer closet. Uh, don't go out openly and pray. An interesting thing about the tallit is that it is that he was referencing the tallit. This is known as the prayer closet. So, so it wasn't meaning go in a closet. I'm not saying you can't go in a closet and pray, but when you look at in the original actual what he meant, he was meaning the, the prayer shawl, the tallit. And what, would meant, what was meant is that they would close this up, and when they would close this up and begin to pray in, inside this prayer cloth, that was known as the prayer closet. It was you, were to blo you blocked out everything around you. And you were in the presence of God. 
and, and you could focus on God. So there's so much symbolism, the colors, the the tassels that are on the end. When, when the, the story in Scripture where it says, or where the woman with the issue of blood said, if I, might, if I might, might touch the hem of his garment, you know, and we understand that that, in our mind, we think that means the hem that went around the bottom of his garment around his foot. But when you study it in context, you'll find that really the garment was the tallit, and if you'll notice the strings that are hanging, there's one string that is hanging down further than all the other strings, and it was actually referencing this thread. Is that mind-boggling? He was ba- she was basically saying, if I could touch only the, the longest thread that hangs from the tallit, the covering, the mantle of Jesus, I know that I'll be made whole. Why would she say that? Because she understood in that day and time the power that was represented in this mantle. So going back to what I was saying, it talks about those that left the fellowship, those that left the fellowship. And those that left the fellowship uh, and then goes right into verse 20 where it says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And I'm going to explain to you what that means, why that is so critical to understanding why they left. See, if you're not covered correctly, if you're not in the anointing, if the anointing is not on your life, then when the trials of the and, and the tactics of the Antichrist spirit comes, you will leave. But if you are covered in the mantle, then then it's a protection. You know, it's oh man, we're gonna get deep over the next few weeks on the power of the mantle. And some of you I can feel it right now. I'm gonna get pushed back, I'm gonna get comments. Uh, you know, people trying to say that I'm telling people to follow Jewish principles. I'm not doing that. I'm, okay, I'm fully New Testament. Okay, I'm all in on Jesus, and I know we got a better covenant based on better promises. I mean, I think we can learn. We, I know we, I know the Old Testament. The Bible tells us are there for examples to teach us things. There's types and shadows, and and I don't, I don't uh, begrudge anyone, or I don't think it's sinful for anyone if they, if they're a, me- of course, certainly, certainly, if they're a Messianic Jew, an authentic Jew person that becomes a believer in Jesus as Yeshua Hamashiach, and they become a Messianic Jew. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them continuing to honor and celebrate the feast. Uh, as long as they know who the Messiah truly is, which is Jesus. That's why they're called the Messianic Jew. Uh, but I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with a believer that's not Jewish, but is a Gentile, wearing a prayer shawl, uh, learning about the feast and things like that. But that's not what this teaching is about, and there's no, I'm not telling you that you have to do that. There's nothing that you have to do. We're not saved by works, lest any man should boast we're saved by grace. Can I get an amen? Can I get a thumbs up? Can I get a fist bump? Can I get a hands up? Can I get a high five? Any kind of cool emoji that I can get out there. But watch this. When you're covered in the anointing and understand when you're covered in the mantle, then you are correctly positioned where you need to be. So you are covered correctly. You need to say that with me, covered correctly. When you are covered correctly, Meaning you are, you've made sure that you have a covering and a mantle on your life, then you have a protection against the temptations of the Antichrist that you would not normally have. Now, are you still with me? Still with me? Make sure you hit that like button. All right, so it says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. Now, that word unction is one of my, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I remember preaching this 25 plus years ago. And looking it up in the old-fashioned way, but long before you had the internet and all this, you had to take out that big old giant Strong's Concordance. Y'all remember that? You had to pull it off the shelf and you had to look at the find the find the the scripture. Then you'd get a number. Then you have to go look in the number in the Strong's Concordance, and you'd look at the number, and it would tell you the Hebrew and the Greek. Well, that's when I first started preaching. Uh, you know, that's how you had to do it. So I remember going back in the Strong's Concordance and looking up the word unction. You know why? And when I told this to my wife today that, I, that this is some of the things it's going to cover, she laughed. She goes, you know, there, there'll be a portion of, of your audience that will get this. There'll be another portion that will have that will be completely clueless. Uh, and I was going to go, uh, unction, function, watch your function. Okay. I, I understand it's conjunction, function, Conjunction, unction, watch your function, or something like that. Schoolhouse rock, okay? Schoolhouse rock. But she, she just laughed. She goes, they're not going to get that. Uh, some people will get it. But but here's what I want to tell you. The anointing and the mantle gives you an unction 
to function. Somebody needs to say that in the live chat. Comment down below if you're watching the review. Comment on Facebook. Comment on Twitter. We got an unction to function. Okay, so that word unction in the original Greek is, the, it, it means this in the original Greek. Watch this. This is crazy. To be smeared upon. It means a smearing. It means some like, like if you were getting some kind of lotion and that lotion was being smeared upon you. So when, he's, when he says, he says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. He's meaning there's something from the Holy Spirit to those that are truly covered that has something smeared upon them. Now, this is just a prayer shawl, okay? That's all it is. It's, a, it's, it's cloth. It's, it's, it's in the natural. There's no power in this by itself. This is symbolic. This is, uh, teaches us so many different things. But God said, what you have is not a prayer shawl. The New Testament took this to another level where this was what was known as the mantle. Let me just go ahead and illustrate to you. The reason I'm wearing this is that when you hear the word the mantle referred to in Scripture, it's referring to this. It's referring to the prayer shawl. This is the mantle. This would be the mantle that is mentioned in Scripture in the Old Testament. But but. John is saying, you have something greater than this. You're not just wearing something around your neck that somebody made with their hands. You have something smeared upon you. Can I get an amen out there? Okay. So it means to smear or rub with oil and to consecrate to an office or religious service. Okay. So, so you know, I believe that if you're going to survive, in all the things that we talk about on our shows here on The Big Picture, when we're not doing a Bible study, and we're just telling you about the chaos that is happening in this world and you know where we're going. The mark of the beast system is not coming, ladies and gentlemen. It is here. The beast system is not about to rise up. It's already rising up. So it's like, you know, the spirit, there's one thing to have the spirit of the Antichrist, but we are the generation that is actually seeing the mechanics the foundation stones of the actual Antichrist uh, kingdom. It's being, it's being laid out right before our eyes. But you better have something smeared on you. You better be covered in something. Because if not, you will leave. And that's what happened. When the wah wah came in, remember when the wah wah came in, you know, all of a sudden we were told we got to shut the churches down. So all over the world, they shut the church down. And this blows my mind when I even think about that I agree to this. I can't believe that I agreed to this. I'll never agree to it again, by the way. But uh, the around the world, right in the middle of that shutdown, of all things, was Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday was in the middle of the shutdown all around the world. 99, 90, there's some of them that never shut down, but 95 to 98% of the churches in the world on Resurrection Sunday closed down. Out of compassion, out of trying to do the right thing, not, you know, most people were not doing that for just to say, yeah, okay, government, whatever you say, I'll do it. No, they were really compassionate about the people and they wanted to, they wanted to protect their family because they were told this is the only way you can protect your family. But the enemy saw that. The enemy said, okay, look how fast that they said yes. But here's the problem. Yeah, the enemy saw that. But, but John said, if they would have been with us, they would have not left us. And here's what happened. 60% of everybody going to church at the beginning of the wah, wah the beginning of the wah, wah lockdowns, never came back when that church opened. When their church opened back up, they never came back. 60%, 6 out of 10 of everybody going to church quit church and never came back. Now, you could say, well, that's the church's fault. I can see the part of that is the church's fault because the church has, especially the Americanized and Westernized version of the church, has, has, has built church growth on coffee and donuts and light and smoke machines and all this other kind of stuff instead of the power of God. You know, they ain't got nothing unction. They ain't got no, no unction. They ain't got nothing rubbed on them, smeared on them. It's all about programs. It's all about performance. Got to get them in, get them out, get them in, get them out. Close down the altars. You know, turn them in, turn it into nothing but a stage. Nobody's coming to the altar anymore. So I can see, yeah, the church has a huge blame. 
But also there's some personal responsibility on the people that walked away too. Because here's the reality. If you have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with God, no matter what your church does, your relationship is with God. And, and if you got something smeared on you, and one of the reasons that, that it's so powerful to have something smeared on you, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I don't know if they even do this anymore, maybe in Texas and some other places like that, but they'd have a rodeo here that'd come in once or twice a year down the road from where I live, and we'd go to that rodeo, and right before the rodeo would start or during the intermission and all that, they let the kids run out in the middle of the, of the rodeo rink or whatever you would call it, the dirt, and they'd have some grease pigs. Some of y'all can remember this. Some of y'all laughing because you're too young. Grease pigs, what are you talking about? They take pigs and they just smear oil all over grease, all over these these pigs, and they tie a little ribbon around the tail of that pig, and uh, they'd have all the kids out there. Me and my brother'd go out there and we'd be standing out in the middle and with a bunch of other kids, and all of a sudden, boom! They'd open up the gate and they'd let them kid them, them pigs go, and uh, them pigs just start running. And we'd chase those pigs, and anybody that could grab hold of that pig and get that ribbon off that was tied onto his tail won a prize. Well, let me tell you something. It seems easy, but that was not easy when it's a grease pig because it had something smeared on him. So you'd put out there and you'd put your hand on him and your hand would just slide right off. Put your hand on him just slide right off. Let me tell you, that's what the anointing is. The anointing, when, it's, when you've got the anointing smeared upon you, that's not saying that you ain't never going to get sick. That's not saying you're never going to have to go through anything. But you've got something on you that when, when sickness and things start trying to attack you and they start trying to grab you, it's not as easy to grab you because you got something smeared on you. Whoo, this is good teaching. That's the mantle. That's the anointing, I should say. That's the anointing. That's the unction, the function. If you're going to really be used by God in this time, you're going to have to have the anointing. Now, what does that have to do with the mantle? Pastor Larry, what does that have to do with the mantle? Well, let me just start the first part tonight off of di diving into some of the most famous scriptures that refer to the mantle in the Old Testament. And let me just show you why they're so, so important. Are you ready? All right, so how in the world somebody would give a thumbs down to the power of God? Somebody just hit the thumbs down to the power of God. That's amazing. Oh, I think it was an accident. They just left it. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not mad at you that you accidentally hit the thumbs down. Uh, but You'd be surprised. When this one's over with, I'll have a lot of comments going, you're just talking about emotionalism. There's no such thing as the anointing. There's no such thing that died off with the apostles. <clears throat> yeah, that ain't never going to work on this channel. So you can comment all you want to, but I ain't listening to that mess. All right, so look here. It's a very, very uh, famous story here. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try my best to get through this without getting too deep down, down the rabbit hole of some things that I could cover here. But there's a purpose in this, in this section. So this is dealing with King Saul, the original king of Israel, Saul. And by the way, thank you for that super chat, uh, Johnny D. What a blessing, man. Thank you so much. Um, and Samuel, the prophet. Okay. All right, let's look at this. So then Samuel, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return to me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return unto you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe. Okay, you understand, when you look at it in the original Hebrew, it's not a robe. It is the tallit. It is the word the tallit. So he sees the edge of his robe or his covering or his mantle. That's what they would refer to as the robe. And it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. And it has given it to a neighbor of yours for it is better, who is better than you. Now that's pretty powerful because what, what I'm reason I read that to you is this. There was such prominence placed upon the mantle of Samuel, the prophet, the prophet of Israel, the voice of God. There was so much respect placed upon the prayer shawl, the tallit, the covering. The New King James calls it the robe, but when you look it up, you understand that it is the, co that is the covering in the mantle. That when he reached out to grab it, it tore, it ripped. So immediately God used that moment 
seeing the Talit tear, and it was it was shocking. I can imagine him thinking, probably, I'm about to be struck dead. I just tore the mantle of the prophet. And, of course, it was a very serious thing because he, he pronounced judgment on the nation of Israel and upon the reign of Saul, and he used the prayer shawl and the mantle ripping to illustrate that when you assault the mantle, when you assault the covering of the, of the voice, the voice that God was using at that time, which he was speaking on behalf of God, you've assaulted God. Because that mantle is a physical representation of the spiritual unction and smearing that was upon Samuel. Samuel could only prophesy to God because he had an anointing on him. This was just a natural realm representation of that anointing. My God, this is good. All right, if you're still with me, let me know that you're still with me uh, in the live chat because I never know if I get kicked off or not nowadays. Now, here's where it's going to get a little crazy. All right, so Samuel dies. Okay. Thank you, Nathan, for letting me know that. Samuel dies. Saul is still alive. Okay. So what is what does Saul do? Saul, I mean, yeah, Saul, what does Saul do? Saul says, I want to go and talk to Samuel. Now he does something that is a whole nother teaching on witchcraft, on demonism, and that is that he consults with a medium. He consults with a psychic. He consults with a fortune teller, a witch, if you will. And, he, and he, she's known for her ability to, quote, unquote, talk to the dead. Like I said, it's a, that's another day, another sermon. So he goes to her, Saul does. And let's just put it up here, and then I'll, I'll finish setting it up. So he goes in there. The king, Saul, goes into this lady and says, do not be afraid. Tell me, what did you see? Because the Bible tells us that she saw Samuel. Okay, now like I said, there's a deep teaching here. She saw Samuel, who's dead, ascending out of the earth. Well, let's just read it. Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. Now, here's my key thing. Like I said, I'm not going to teach it tonight, but for future teaching, if you want to know where I stand, the most key part of all of this is where she says, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? What is his form? What did this spirit look like? Was it an angel? What, tell me about this spirit that you saw. And he said, she said, an old man coming up, here it is. And he is covered with a mantle. <whistles> Do you see that? So this woman says, I saw a spirit come up out of earth, and he is covered with a mantle. And here's the next part that's key. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped his face to the ground, and he bowed down. Wow. Now, like I said, I could teach on demonism. I could teach on witchcraft. I could teach on necromancy. I could teach on all these things, and I will in the future. Maybe when we get a little bit closer to Halloween, teach a little bit on demons. But, uh, but here's what I want you to see. There's a lot of debate on whether this was actually Samuel or not. Now, you can believe that it was Samuel. You can believe that God allowed Samuel to come up out of Abraham's bosom because remember, before Jesus died on the cross, all of the Old Testament saints went down to a place called Sheol. I mean, down, down to a place yeah, uh, called Sheol, uh, which is uh, in the King James translated hell, but it wasn't, it is not Hades hell uh, where the devil was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was a place down beneath the earth that was separated by a river. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? He's on one side, he sees Lazarus on the other side, separated by a great gulf, 
It's known as Abraham's bosom. And during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb, he goes down to Abraham's bosom, reveals himself to be the Messiah. When he comes back from the dead on the third day, Abraham's bosom comes out from the depths of the earth and ascends to heaven with him 40 days later and is now in heaven. It's known as paradise. So, yeah, Samuel did go down. He was down in Abraham's bosom awaiting the Messiah. So he knew that. Everybody knew that. That was, that was a teaching. Now watch this. He, she did not say, I got news for you. This woman knew Samuel. This woman knew Samuel. Everybody knew the prophet because the Bible said when he came to town, they hid because they knew the judgment of God was coming. This woman knew who Samuel was, and for certainly the demons that were in her knew who Samuel was. So what did you see, the king says? She says, I saw a spirit come up out of the earth. Then you hear Saul say, what was his form? And when the demon heard that, the demon knew there was an open door of deception. Well, I don't even have to say that it was Samuel. I just have to describe this spirit as being covered by a mantle. And watch this. It wasn't the real mantle. No. But when she said, I saw this spirit covered with a mantle, immediately Saul perceived that it was Samuel because Saul identified Samuel with his mantle. Are y'all hearing me? Saul identified Samuel with his mantle. That is hugely important because they knew they would, you would never see Samuel without his mantle. You would never see Samuel without his covering. He would not dare do ministry without covering. He would not dare go into his prayer closet without covering. He would not dare fight demons without his covering. But we have a, and I know we don't have to wear these, okay? This is just for a sermon illustration tonight. That's, why this, that's the only reason I'm wearing this. I'm not going to wear this all the time you see me on here, and I'm not judging people if they do. I'm just saying I don't have to wear this because this is a natural a, a human and earthly type and shadow of what I'm really covered by, and that's an unction of the Holy One, the anointing. But yet we have a generation of people. This is what John was saying. They would not have left us. They would not have left us if they had, had, had something smeared on them. If there was a mantle on them, they would not have left us. And, and because remember, he said, they left us. They were not of us. If they were of us, they would have never left us. But he says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. In other words, he said, you didn't leave like they did because you have something on you that they did not have on them. You have an anointing. You have a covering. You have a mantle. You have something smeared upon you. But yet, this is what's happened in this generation. This is why 60% of the church walked away as soon as the wow wow hit because a long time ago, long before the wow wow, they chose to take this off and set it aside. See, we got, we got, a, we got a, a massive amount of people that call themselves Christians but do not want to be covered correctly. They don't want to be covered by their pastor. They don't want to be covered by a spiritual father or mother. But more importantly than that, they don't want to submit themselves to the covering of the Word of God. They want to live their life any way they want to live it and when push comes to shove, they're going to make that decision based on what they want and what they desire, not what's on them. My God. I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is a word for this moment. This is a word for this moment. Now, whew, got a few more minutes, and we're going to, get, we're going to go even deeper now. We're going to go even deeper now. Who is the most famous person in Scripture associated with a mantle. Well, it's not Samuel, even though Samuel wore it. Watch this. I'm going really, to make some of y'all mad. You don't think this is heresy when you say the most famous because he is the most famous, and that's Jesus. Jesus wore a mantle. Jesus wore a prayer shawl. Jesus wore a tallit all the days of his ministry because he was, he was a Jew. 
but he's not the most famous one associated with a mantle. In fact, there's only a couple of places, one being the one I've already talked about, the woman with the issue of blood, where it's very obvious that there's the mantle, and then the other would be when he's describing the prayer closet and things like that. But the most famous person in Scripture associated with a mantle is the prophet Elijah. I would say that that's what we know about mantles. But really not so much because of his mantle on him, but he became famous because of what the power of the mantle that was on him as it was handed down to Elisha. Are y'all with me? Is this good preaching? If it's good preaching, give me, give me some love out there. Give me some thumbs up. Give me some hearts. I want to remind you that every Monday night, this is our big show that we do, Sandy and I, for two hours, y'all, at 7 p.m. Central Time. For two hours, we break down news, and we tell you things that you ain't going to hear nowhere else. And I'm telling you, we need to blow this channel up. We need to let people know about what is happening here on The Big Picture. Now, I want to show you something. Let me set this up. So we know the scripture of Mount Carmel. We know the story of Mount Carmel. And, you know, Elijah's up on top of the Mount Carmel. He challenges the prophets of Baal. He says, let the God that answers by fire, let that God be God. And, of course, if you don't know the story, spoiler alert, the God that answers by fire is our God. It's not Baal. They cut themselves. They did all their perverted stuff. Nothing happened. Elijah said, pour water on mine. Pour it again. Pour it a third time. And they just stood back and said, God, do your thing. And I said, Pfft consumed it. Bible said even licked it up, evaporated all the water. I mean, the prophets of Baal were killed. Big victory for God. Then all of a sudden, you know, he's sort of basking in, in the moment and uh, a word gets to Jezebel. Okay. And she says, you go tell that prophet that what he did to my prophets of Baal, I'm going to do to him today before the sun goes down. And it wasn't even her that he heard. It was the word of someone else. And for whatever reason, it's crazy, proving the humanity of the prophet. Even though he's powerful and he's anointed, he's still a human being. He runs for his life. And he ends up being in a cave. Now, if you know the story, that's where we're going to pick it up right now. He's hiding out in a cave. And God comes to him and challenges him in that cave. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. This is at the edge of the, of the cave. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was that when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, a lot of preachers will preach, what are you doing here, Elijah? A lot of preachers will preach the still, small voice, that he wasn't in the fire, he wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in all the other things, he was in the still, small voice. But it's surprising to me how few preachers stop and park on verse 13, that when he heard that still, small voice, and there's a lot of debate about what did he hear? What did Elijah hear? What was that still, small voice? What was the message? All we know is a still, small voice. Do we have any evidence of what it was that God said to him in that still, small voice? Now, I believe we do. And do I have emphatic proof? No. Is it the gospel according to Larry? Yes. But I believe that we do. Because when he heard that still, small voice, what did he do? The very first thing that he did after he heard that voice was the Bible said he wrapped himself in his mantle, okay? And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and he began to have a conversation with God. Now, 
Ooh. <sighs> what was it that he heard? I believe that he heard God say, it is time for you to pass the mantle. Now, watch this. Fast forward in the story of Elijah and Elisha. You know, Elisha, you know, he follows him and he gets the double portion anointing. And spoiler alert, that's where we're going tonight and to next, next week. But the key thing about that, getting a little ahead of myself, but to sort of set up the power of what I'm about to tell you is this. Right before Elijah disappears into the heavens in a, in a chair to fire, and Elisha sees him, we have the whole story of the double portion, there is a group of young men that come to Elisha. This is in your Bible. They are called the students of the school of the prophets, the sons of the prophets. There was a school. It's very obvious in Scripture. There was a school of the prophets. It was being taught by Elijah. So Elijah was training, was, was literally training the next generation of those that would flow in the prophet because he knew that one day he would be gone. So it definitely implies to us that in that teaching and the training of the sons of the prophets, Elijah told his students that he was going to be taken by God and he was not going to die that he was going to be basically raptured and taken out of this world. How do I know that? Because those students, when they came to Elisha in that story, and we'll get to it in the coming weeks, and you can go ahead and read it in your Bible ahead of me. It's been in there for thousands of years. Uh, he, the students say, do you not know? What are you doing? Shouldn't you be prepared? Do you not know that the Lord will take our leader from us this day? So it was very obvious that he had already told them, I'm going away. The difference between Elisha and the rest of his fellow students is Elisha got it. He understood that it was not a diploma or a promotion or a position in that classroom that was going to get him the mantle. He understood what was going to get him the mantle was not to look for the mantle, but to stay close to the man that the mantle was on. Because mantles transfer. Oh, my goodness. So it was very obvious that it was time for him to pass the mantle. I believe in that still small voice. God said, stand up, get ready. What I've been preparing for you, it's time. All right, here we go. Let's get into this. And we'll start winding this thing down, but we got some big scripture to read here before we close tonight. So he departed from there. God told him to go. And he found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him. Catch it. Passed by him. And threw his mantle at him. All right? For the sake of illustration, let's take the scripture off and watch this. And threw his mantle at him. All right? You with me? I'm going to fix my studio in there. I can't see my Bible because I threw the mantle on him. All right. So. And he threw, and he, watch this, let's go back to the beginning. So he found him plowing with oxen. Oxen. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you. And he said, well, go back again. What have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elisha, I mean Elijah, and became his servant. Mm, 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 mm. Have you hit that like button yet? Have you invited someone to join this? Have you sent this to anybody? Listen, this is what everybody needs to do. When this show's over with, copy the link to this, Open up a text message, text your mama, text your daddy, text your kids, text your brother, text your sister, text your uncle, text your aunt, text, text your coworker, text your schoolmate, text everybody you know, 
and paste that YouTube link in there and say, you have to watch this because this is a critical word for the final generation. Okay? Let's blow this thing up. Let's change the world. Now, here's the thing that's so powerful about this. He gets hit with the mantle. Boom. He's, what's he doing? He's not in a church service. He's just out here providing for his family. This is a day where he just gets up and he goes and he's, he's working. But the thing you got to know about Elisha is the Bible tells us something unique about Elisha. Elisha, what set him different than all these other sons of the prophets and school of the prophets, is the Bible says he would follow Elijah and would wash his hands for him. So Elijah's getting ready to eat. It was custom. You took care of the prophet. You honored the prophet. And the prophet would put his hands out. And Elisha was the ones that would pour, pour the water over his hands and wash his hands to get him ready to eat. And then the Bible says that Elisha would hold, oh, y'all ain't, ain't ready for this. Go read your Bible. King James says would hold the coat, would hold the coat of Elijah while he was eating. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't his coat. It was his mantle. It was his robe. It was his covering. So long before he was ever hit with that mantle, he was taking care of that mantle. He was honoring that mantle. He was, but when he was honoring that mantle, he was honoring the man of God. You see, when you honor the mantle of the man of God, you honor the man of God. And when you honor the mantle of the man of God and you honor the man, the man of God, you're honoring God. Some of y'all can't handle that one, what I just said. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If the Bible says, given, it shall be given to you, press down good measure, shaken together, running over, shall other men give back to you? Guess what? God blesses you through the hands of other people. You will lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. He's the one that does the healing, but man is the one, woman is the one that lays hands upon the sick and tells the sickness to go. So the reality is this. God moves through man. So this is simply a symbolic thing of what is smeared upon the man of God that you are supposed to be covered by, okay? Psalm 133 says, how beautiful it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. And then, but then it's so powerful. It says, it's like the oil that was poured upon Aaron's head that ran down to his beard and then down to the body. See, if you're not correctly positioned in, and covered in the right place in the body, then you're not positioned for the oil that's flowing down. Now, here's something very powerful about Elijah and Elisha as we, as we get close, but we ain't ready to close yet, so don't you jump off yet because I got one more powerful point to tell you. He realizes he's held this. He's held this. Can you imagine the church of today having to do what Elisha did? Who does he think he is? I mean, I'm the one that's getting dirty. I, I'm, a, I'm a bivocational minister. I got a family to feed. I'm tilling. I, I got oxen I got to take care of. I have to work the fields. And then when I get off work, I got to come, I got to, come to, the te to the temple and hold a man's prayer shawl, wash his hands, and stand there hungry. I hadn't even ate yet. I got to stand there in the corner holding his, his mantle while he eats in front of me. What kind of ministry is this? Who does he think he is? Does he think he's so good that he can eat for me? Ain't nobody holding my prayer shawl. Ain't nobody holding my mantle. That's what the modern church would do. That's why the modern church is not anointed, because they're not willing to serve. Jesus said, let the greatest of you become the, the greatest servant. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Are y'all hearing me preach tonight on this Wednesday night? Live on YouTube Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. Now watch this. When he got hit with that, do you know what most people in the modern church would have done? Woo, yes, finally. Finally. I've been waiting on this moment. Come on. Yeah, I'm the man. Look at me. Woo, y'all, check me out. Check me out. Don't look good. Don't look good. Look at, look at me. Look at me. Oh, I'm the prophet. I'm the prophet. Nope. He grabbed it, looked at it, and took off running after Elijah. Because the Bible said it ran by me to it. He didn't slow down and stop and say, excuse me, buddy. Hate to interrupt your work. Here, take this. 
No, he ran after him. He ran after him. And when he caught him, he understood everything changed today. I know, I'll, I know I'm never going to be here again. Give me, can you at least give me time to go kiss my mother and father by? Please. Elijah said, yeah, what have I done? Go do it. Watch what Elijah did. Elijah said, okay, thank you, but there's more that I got to do because I've been hit with the mantle. He goes and he kills the oxen that he was just tilling behind. He skins them, he carves them up, and then he takes the plow that was his means of provision and he breaks it into pieces and he starts a fire with the plow. And then he cooks the oxen on the fire from the wood of the plow. Why? He burned the plow because he did not want to give himself a plan B. There is no plan B when the mantle hits you. You're either all in or you're not in at all. And he realized at that point my whole life has changed. And if I don't burn this plow, then in the back of my mind I'm always going to say, if this mantle don't work out, I've always got the plow. But God said, no, I need you to go all in with the mantle. Now That don't mean you got to quit your job. I ain't saying that when you're called to the ministry. I'm just saying there's got to be a sense of things that used to give you strength. you got to burn those plows because now you've been hit with the mantle. But he realized that even though he didn't get hit with the mantle, he still, it really wasn't his yet because it had to be passed down. So that's why he runs after him. And at some point we know that he gives it back to Elijah because the story goes on as they are journeying together after that day that they make it to the final place, and he says, okay, you've nagged me and nagged me and nagged me. What do you want? What is it that you want? He said, I'll be honest with you. What I want is a double portion of your anointing, a double portion of what's on you. And Elijah says, you have asked a hard thing. Hmm. Because you don't understand when you watch Christian TV or YouTube or some stream and listen to a podcast and you see all that God's doing in my life, you don't know what I had to go through to get to there. You don't know what I battle in the middle of the night. You don't know the demons that I deal with. You don't know what my wife goes through, what my kids go through. You don't know the financial struggle. You don't know the sickness. You don't know the pain. You don't know the self-doubt. You don't know the times in the cave, the times sitting up under the tree asking God to kill you, to take you out, the times you want to quit. You don't know, son, what comes with this mantle. All you've ever seen is you've washed my hands and you stood in the side of the room and you watched me eat and you dreamed of one day wearing this, but you don't know what comes with it. Now you ask him for a double portion. Son, you've asked a hard thing. But I'll tell you this. If you see me when I go away, you can have what you've asked. Can I tell you something? Next week I'm going to get into some deep stuff. And it is going to step on some religious devil's heads. Because he didn't see. He didn't say, if you see the mantle, you can have the mantle. He said you can have the mantle and double what that mantle represents. If you see me. See, people, we know we don't put our faith in man. We know we don't look at man. But if you ain't submissive, so you don't have a submissive life to be under the covering of somebody, if you think you're too good to be covered, you will never receive the mantle. My God. Was that a good word tonight? Thank you so much for being on the Bible study tonight. Go to LarryRaglan.com and buy our book. Become a partner with us. Support us. Thank you so much for being a part of the Bible study tonight. We love you, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Sandy and I got a special episode. Me and Sandy are going to do tomorrow night live uh, here on this channel on, instead of the Kingdom Intelligence Report because it's the fifth Thursday.
5th Thursday. So Sandy and I will be here, and we're going to be covering a lot of good things. So we'll see you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. If you're watching this live, if you watch it on the replay, watch it on the replay. See you when we remind you, we ain't woke, but we are certainly awake. Share this. Share this. Get on YouTube, Facebook. Get on YouTube. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs>